Good morning. My name is Hale Seitan. I'm the Vice President of Interfi Systems and Data Analytics Division within the Institute for Public Research here at CNN. On behalf of our President and CEO, Catherine McGrady, would like to welcome you to our first virtual event jointly hosted by CNA two flagship event series, the Inclusive National Security and National Security Seminar Initiative. Today's event is the Crackdown in Iran, a Women, Peace, and Security Situation Spotlight. Before we begin, a few administrative notes. Today's event is recorded. A recording will be available on our site and we'll follow up with a link if you would like to share it with any of the colleagues who could not join us today. After some opening remarks, I will hand it over to today's moderator, Milanfi Samara Nayakaya, and you will get a chance to hear from our panelists. We'll close the event with um, the audience Q&A, so we encourage you to send your questions if you are participating through Zoom, please send your questions through the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. If you are calling in, you can send your questions to CNA underscore NSS at CNA.org. If this is your first acquaintance with CNA, we are a nonprofit research organization comprised of the Center for Naval Analysis, and the Institute for Public Research. The Center for Naval Analysis is federally funded research and development center for the US Navy and Marine Corps. But our work supports decision makers across the Dep Department of Defense and other US government agencies. Our Institute for Public Research supports civilian agencies in a wide range of areas such as Homeland Security and infrastructure protection, digital transformation and emerging technologies, public safety, justice, public health preparedness and emergency response, and emergency operations at all levels of government. Inclusive national security, hashtag inclusive NATSEC, if you are following us on social media, is a CNA funded initiative dedicated to fostering discussions on inclusivity in national security among the community of national security professionals who are exploring the implications of a structural bias, uh, biases in their work. In its first two years, the series has explored race and gender respectively. And in 2023, the series will look at intersectionality. Past events have focused on diversity in wargaming gender and international development, and bias in artificial intelligence. This series has attracted a wide range of subject matter experts across the disciplines as both the speakers and moderators. CNA's National Security Seminar Series brings together thought leaders from across the US government, academic, and research institutions the private sector and US partner nations to share their expertise, facilitate discussions and contribute to an ongoing dialogue about issues affecting US national security. The theme for this year's series is mobilizing cooperation to advance national security. Competition has been the defining paradigm shaping US national security strategy in recent years, but cooperation both international and domestic, has become increasingly critical to meeting security challenges. And highlighted in uh, President Biden's recently, uh, recently national security strategy. At events earlier this season, experts discussed China's economic activity in the Arctic, how the US can counter PRC and Russian alliance, alliance wedge strategies, and the, new, the use of drones in the war in Ukraine. I'm particularly excited to welcome you to today's event because of my personal connection with the issue. 26 years ago, I fled religious apartheid in Iran and as a refugee came to the US to normal life 
to freedom. Since the inception of the Islamic Republic in Iran 43 years ago, the Baha'is, that is the religious community I belong to, faced severe discrimination and persecution. They were expelled from work, not allowed to attend universities to pursue higher education, arrested, tortured, and even executed. But over time, the tyranny in, country, in the country did not discriminate. It expanded to all layers and sectors of the society. As a girl, I went to public school having to cover my head as the mandatory dress code. This wasn't the choice of any of my classmates or their parents, it was just a law. We would not be let into the school without the hijab. When I was a teenager, the morality police was established. They would make rounds and arrest you for anything they found non-compliant. You lose a job, colorful polish on your nails, walking alongside someone of the other gender. Ask any Iranian woman if they have had the nightmare that they left home and forget, forgot their, to put their hijab on and were caught by the morality police. The answer is most likely affirmative. I know it was a frequent nightmare for me, not only when I lived there, even years after I left. Today, decades later, a 22-year-old girl named Mahsa Amiri was captured by the morality police for not wearing her hijab correctly and was bludgeoned to death. Her death instigated the thought in every Iranian woman's mind, hey, that could have been me. So today that's what's in my mind. I could have easily been Massa. And now that I have had that fortune of escaping those conditions and not facing her fate, I feel that I should be her voice. The message of this movement, women, life, freedom, also brings my Iranian story close to my own American values, freedom and justice. I'm personally very grateful to CNA and all my colleagues for providing this platform to talk about what's happening in Iran and to the Iranians. The topic is not only important for women's rights and human rights, but also important for spreading peace and democracy in the world. It needs our attention and support. The events are fast moving and evolving, so I encourage you to follow and share what's happening in Iran. And to that end, as I said earlier, we are recording this event, so it will be available for you to share with others as you wish. I'll now pass it off to Nilanti Samaranayaka, Research Program Director of CNA Strategy and Policy Analysis Program, who will introduce CNA's foreign peace and security work and today's fantastic speakers. Nilanti, over to you. Thanks very much, Hale, uh, for sharing your uh, perspective on, on the issue. I'll make some brief remarks about women, peace, and security, given the centrality of women to the Iranian protests. Since the passage of the Women, Peace, and Security Act in 2017, the U.S. government is increasingly examining the role that women and gender play at the intersection of civil society and security, both regionally and globally. CNA has a growing portfolio of WPS work and conducts various types of research with the gender analytical lens. In the last few years, we've hosted events on cross-regional challenges and opportunities presented by WPS, as well as the impacts of the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan for women and girls. We also completed a congressionally mandated review of gender roles within terrorist groups, and this year we're conducting another congressionally mandated review of U.S. counterterrorism training to ensure it adequately accounts for gender roles in terrorist groups. And now to our event. Uh, 
we're honored to have with us Nazi Moenian and CNA's own Michael Connell. Dr. Nazi Moenian is a non-resident advisor at the Middle East Institute, and she received a PhD from the University of St. Andrews. During the 2016 election, Nazi advised Secretary Clinton's campaign as a member of its foreign policy advisory group on Iran. She previously consulted on Iranian affairs at the Council on Foreign Relations, and in 2001 became a UN envoy for a variety of Jewish nonprofit organizations. She's helped produce several acclaimed documentaries and is a frequent contributor to international publications. As a native Iranian, Nazi was raised in Tehran and immigrated with her family to the US at the onset of the 1979 revolution. Dr. Michael Connell is an expert at CNA on Persian Gulf security issues, the armed forces of Iran, U.S. Gulf Cooperation Council, security cooperation, and adversary cyber policy and strategy. He served as CNA's field analyst to Naval Forces Central Command, and prior to joining CNA, he was an intelligence officer in the U.S. Army. Mike has a PhD in History and Middle Eastern Studies from Harvard University and a BA in Near East Studies from Brandeis University. I'd like to thank our speakers for joining us. So we'll start off by hearing from Mike about the Iranian regime's response to the protests and what this means for regime stability in both the short and long term. And then we'll turn to Nazi, who will speak about the grievances and frustrations driving the protests, the importance of women to the current protests, and the role of women in Iranian society more broadly. First, over to Mike. Thank you, Nalati. Um, so looking at the protests, it's been 39 days since Massa uh, died in police captivity. Now, the regime claimed that she had a heart attack. Um, and, you know, I think most outside observers don't believe these claims. In fact, the term heart issues or heart attack has almost become a euphemism for death at the hands of the security services lately. But Massa's deaths sparked unrest just hours after it occurred. And in the almost 40 days since, the protests have spread across Iran, transcending ethnic, sectarian, age, and gender divisions. The issue of the hijab, and in particular mandatory veiling, was the spark that lit the unrest, although the protests have become much wider in scope. Hijab, however, or specifically the right not to wear the hijab, has become a symbol for the protesters. It's almost become like the, the tricolore in, in revolutionary France. As the unrest has spread, the regime has cracked down and hundreds have been killed and thousands have been detained. Now, this isn't the first time that the regime has had to deal with unrest. Uh, throughout several points in Iranian history, the regime, most recently, 2019, 2020, but also 2017, 2011, the Green Movement in 2009, there have been many instances of the regime having to deal with unrest. This is a little bit different, though. Two things. First, the momentum. So far, 40 days into this, or almost 40 days into this, the protests showed no signs of ebbing. In the past, the unrest would erupt, the regime would crack down, and then smaller protests would follow, like sort of like aftershocks of an earthquake. That, isn't, that hasn't happened yet. Second, you have scope. This time the protests appear to transcend almost all social divisions, class, ethnic divisions, sectarian divisions, the urban rural divide, age. So it's really widespread. What's driving the protests? I see a confluence of, of um, four different factors. First, you have the morality crackdown that's been implemented by the current president of Iran, Ibrahim Raisi. Now, Hijab's been mandatory in Iran since 1983. However, the regulations governing hijab and chador have been unevenly applied. Under the previous Iranian president, Hassan Rouhani, hijab enforcement was relaxed, encouraging many women to challenge hijab conventions by, for instance, wearing scarves loosely around their heads, showing their hair. But Ibrahim Raisi, who was elected last year, has advocated a return to strict observance of the Islamic dress code. And he also ordered the Supreme Council of the Cultural Revolution, that's the government body that deals with these regulations, to implement 
the regulations, the strict regulations that have been imposed under um, President Rouhani's predecessor, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. Now, polls have shown that support for mandatory veiling appears to be on the decline. Not surprisingly, many women have responded by defiantly and bravely flouting the regulations by removing their headscarves altogether. Sorry. Um, women such as Elnaz Rakibi, she's the, the climber who recently got a lot of attention because she, she was on a sporting event outside of Iran and, and didn't wear the hijab as she was supposed to during the event and got into trouble for it when she returned. So you have this uneven application of, of morality rules that are now being applied strictly, which has, has generated some of the protests. And I should add that the Gashte Ershad has been busy in other areas as well. They've been clamping down on on parties, on music venues. Um, in short, they've been they've been eliminating the escape valve that the regime has had for, for other issues like economic discontent. Which leads me to the second factor, economic issues. Right now, Iran's facing, it has a shrinking middle class, it has rising poverty, it has nearly 50% inflation, which is, is a significant factor in uh, eroding people's confidence in the regime. You have rising prices for food and other necessities. You have income inequality. So there's a perception that regime elites are benefiting while most Iranians suffer. Also, there's the issue of corruption. So there are a lot of high profile accounts that have gotten attention of politicians' children living in expensive villas in North Tehran or Karaj while the regime's kind of preaching poverty and abstinence. US sanctions against Iran's energy and financial sectors have contributed to some of this, of course, but economic mismanagement and corruption are also major factors. Interesting fact, currently Iran is exporting around 2.5 million barrels of oil a day. That compares to 4 million in 2016 and 6 million in the 1970s before the revolution. So oil energy exports are actually a major factor generating revenue for the regime. And that gives you some idea of kind of some of the pressure that um, the economy is under. I think the fact that refinery workers have gone on strike is likely to exacerbate these problems for the regime. Information is another critical factor. Both the regime and the protesters view the fight for the information domain as critical. It's about a battle to control the narrative. And so far, the protesters appear to retain the upper hand. The regime has tried to choke off communications by throttling the internet, especially in the afternoon and evening hours when most of the, the protests occur. And the regime's also engaged in satellite jamming. Um, for instance, the French UTEL satellites, um, Starlink and some other satellites have been jammed. Um, and they also crack down on the use of VPNs. Despite this, however, information continues to flow and images of Iranian police and Basij militia brutalizing protesters continue to leak out of Iran and motivate additional protests. If you want to understand what's happening in Iran right now, you really need to turn to social media sites, opposition sites such as um, 1500 Tasvir, Iran International, and there are many others. The regime, in turn, has blamed external enemies, particularly the US, Israel, and more recently, Saudi Arabia, for stoking unrest inside the regime by using information. And perhaps in this case, because Iran is also engaged in covert information warfare, there's a bit of mirror imaging going on with the Iranian government. The fourth factor is the regime's response to the protests. The regime views the, the protests as an existential crisis. Iran's supreme leader, Ali Khamenei, has made it clear that the protests are, pose a great threat to the Islamic Republic and the government, and that any opposition to the regime will be dealt with harshly. Um, this has resulted in regime brutality against the protesters, including children, uh, and this has created anti-regime martyrs. Uh, just one random case, for instance, in Balochistan in the southeast in the city of Zalhidan, 80 protesters were killed in one incident, and the riots started over claims that the police had raped a 15-year-old girl in detention. So these and other incidents, it's hard to watch what's happening and remain dispassionate. I mean, I find that as an analyst, CNA, we take great pride in being detached and analytical. But when you see what's happening to the protesters in Iran, you can't help but, but be touched by it because it, it's, it really is brutal, the response. 
So how has the regime responded? So initially, after Massa's death, the regime relied on the police, the law enforcement forces, to crack down on the protesters. I think the response, they wanted a light-handed response at first. They didn't realize where this was going and they didn't want to provoke more unrest. So initially it was limited. Um, and they relied on the, on the police, who, by the way, are largely composed of conscripts. So there is sort of a question, I think, in the regimes, um, how it views the police is maybe not as reliable as some other elements. As the protests spread, they brought in the Basij. The Basij are a paramilitary force. It's affiliated with the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, the SEPA. Um, they are an all-volunteer force, and they, they tend to be viewed as very committed to the regime. They're kind of the, the regime's ideological heavies for dealing with uh, protests. And they have special brigades to do this, too, the Ashura, the Zafra brigades. One of the techniques they've been using to disrupt the protests is that they isolate individual protesters from crowds and then they detain them. So they'll move around the protests, they'll get people, to, they'll hive off people separately and they'll, they'll detain them. Sometimes they'll dress in civilian clothes so the protesters don't know who the police are. They've used ambulances, for instance, and disguised them as police, as, um, sorry, they've used, police vans disguised as ambulances to detain protesters. Once the protesters are secured, um, and if judged a threat, they're sent to prison where they're sometimes tortured. If they're deemed less of a threat, they're released with a warning that they're now being tracked by the police. And they've been employing collective security measures also, so guilt by association. So for instance, children are sometimes released to their parents with a warning that the parents will be held accountable if their children misbehave. And you've had instances too where whole families have been detained. So there's kind of a collective approach to dealing with security. In addition to these hard security measures, the regime's focus on combating what it perceives as the pernicious effect of information from external sources. And some of these techniques I've already mentioned, like the jamming and the and throttling back on external internet access. But there have also been, they've had the official media outlets, for instance, which have towed the government line that the protesters are unwitting stooges of malign foreign actors who want to eliminate Iran's independence. And they've also employed some sophisticated techniques to sow doubts in the minds of the protesters. So they've used forced confessions. Um, I, there have been some accounts of, of regime figures meeting with some of the disaffected elements uh, to hear their concerns. So for instance, they've, they've, you know, they've had instances where they've, they've sent um, politicians and clergy to prisons to talk to um, some of the regime protesters. And the, the real attempt that's going on there is they're trying to co-opt uh, co some of the protesters and hive off you know, elements that they view as less threatening. Um, they've also had some, I was reading an account in, in the Iranian newspaper, it was um, Fars News or Tasneem, basically claiming that uh, they had the the head of the LEF, the law enforcement cyber police, claiming that if you use VPNs, you could be introducing all sorts of harmful um, viruses to your computers or your, your mobile devices. So they're using some sophisticated techniques to kind of try and get people to avoid using information. So I won't, I won't comment, I'll conclude by talking about the, the I'm not going to comment about the prospects for another revolution, uh, but I will comment on what I think it would take for the protests to succeed in terms of if they, if they were to overthrow the regime or where this is headed. Um, there are some indicators or signposts on the road to a potential revolution that I would expect to see if one was going to occur. Some of them have already occurred. So I mentioned the protests have expanded to multiple segments of, of Iranian society. Um, the protests, I would expect to see them expand geographically outside of Tehran and other major urban centers, and this has happened. Um, so, you know, you had other instances like in 2009 with the green protests where there were, you know, there was significant unrest, but it was localized in places like Tehran. Duration is another factor. In the past, most of the protests would last, you know, three weeks, four weeks, but they would peter out. And then you'd have pockets of unrest that would emerge afterwards. They're almost like the, the after effects of an earthquake. 
But this time, the protests are going strong, and we're we're just about short of 40 days into this, so they're still going strong. So the duration is a different factor as well. And finally, you have the heavy-handed response by the by the regime. Um, I, we're seeing some of the heavy-handed response now, but I think things are going to get worse before they get better. Uh, the regime isn't panicking yet, but if it gets close to panicking, it's it's really going to get um, it's going to get bloody. I think two more goals or two more um, signposts I would expect to see that haven't happened yet. First, you'd have a coalescing of objectives and goals by the protesters. The protests still seem to be disparate. Uh, many of the protesters are calling for the end of the regime. They're shouting things like Marg Bar Dictator, which is death of a dictator, referring to the Supreme Leader. Um, but what next? You know, beyond calling for the end of the regime, what are the protesters going to replace the regime with? Or what do they what would they like to? In 1979, during the during the Iranian Revolution, there were many competing goals. Many of the groups opposed the Shah. Um, but they had a clear idea of what they wanted to put in place of the monarchy. And we haven't quite seen that yet. It could occur, just hasn't happened yet. Finally, I'd expect to see some emergence of opposition leadership. So far, the protests have been diffused with almost, with almost no leaders to kind of claim the mantle of leadership for them. On the one hand, this has proven beneficial to the opposition because it's difficult for the regime to crack down on a movement that has no identifiable leaders. The regime has been forced to play whack-a-mole, trying to stop random protests from bubbling up all over Iran. On the other hand, though, the opposition lacks direction and an agility to respond to the government's moves and an individual or individuals to rally around. Also, if the regime wished to negotiate or is looking for an off-ramp to the protests, it has no one to negotiate with. So most successful revolutions have coalesced around individuals or groups of individuals. These don't appear right away, however. So there's, there's you know, this that could still occur in, in the protests that are currently occurring. Finally, and I would say this really signals problems for the regime. If you if you saw defections from the regime's basic support, particularly in the security services. So I mentioned that the the law enforcement forces, the police, are mostly conscripts. If you start to see the police laying down their arms, um, going over to the opposition that's when the regime's facing a, an existential crisis. Uh, so on that optimistic note, I will uh, conclude my piece. Thanks, Mike, for that sense of how the regime views the protests. Before we turn to Nezi, we welcome your questions. So please submit them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. You can also send your questions to CNA underscore NSS at CNA.org. Now I'd like to welcome Nazi to join us to shed some light on the protests themselves. Nazi? I think you're on mute, Nazi. Thank you very much. I am delighted to be here and this is such a timely conversation and I welcome the opportunity to speak on the behalf of Iranian women, any oppressed minority around the world, women are not like minorities, but uh, speaking on behalf of justice and advocating for it. So this is a great platform and I thank you for inviting me. I, um, Michael basically um, covered a broad area of how to and why and maybe how uh, when uh, if this is this regime will collapse and I, I I think he was right on on many many points um, I will speak to the uh, demographics of the of the protest movements of the role of women uh, which I was asked to shed more light on this is the first revolution led by women ever in the history of, of uh, since we've been covering, since we have been keeping records of uh, political upheavals. And um, this is also a revolution that, I'm calling it a revolution because this is, I'm conflating my hopes with facts on the ground. Uh, people have started to call this a revolution. The hashtag Iran Revolution 2022 is trending. And also um, Iranian revolution is, on, is the headline of many of the, um, periodicals around the world today and yesterday, specifically in Canada. Um, 
these protests or revolutions, if they come to be, um, are emblematic of what the Iranian women and the Iranian society in general um, has been aspiring to achieve over the past 43 years. And it has reached with the killing of Masa Amini, a pivotal point where uh, the Iranian people decided that the revolution that was enacted by their parents and grandparents, this younger generation, they call themselves the TikTok generations, is no longer tenable. Uh, it doesn't hold any future for them, for their children. Um, it doesn't speak to who they are, who they aspire to be. Um, it doesn't speak to the generation that's very tuned in to what's happening around the world. Um, they are constantly on Instagram and TikTok. They know their lives are different than their lives of their counterparts in Western countries um, or almost any other country around the world, which is not an, under Islam, political Islam um, regime or uh, governance. And they demand a reset of of the 1979 revolution. They demand um, their basic rights. They demand to be a participant on the international forum. They demand their leaders to think of themselves first instead of funneling money and arms to countries around the region. Um, and, and they basically are holding their leaders accountable. And since the leaders refuse to be held accountable, and this is the big, uh, big factor in this. They're acting as change makers to end this regime. So why change and why not reform? And why, why has it been that for 43 years, um, they've accepted this norm uh, that the Islamic regime has created for them? And why are they taking to the streets now? Um, I, I you, you know, there are so many parallels between this and 1979 revolution. I remember the revolution. I was a little kid. But um, at, at the same time that this revolution is different, this uprising is different, it's also very similar. So in 1979, there was um, discontent with the rule of the Shah. There was nepotism, um, corruption in the court circle and um, basically a lack of public space for political activism. So the Shah had created this middle-class space, which was, um, was ed educated, um, they were subsidized, their education was subsidized by the uh, Pahlavis and the, um, and basically they were, they had become a participant in the Western orbit. Their vacations were to the West, Europe was a, close destination for the families to travel to. Uh, they read um, the, the, the treaties of Descartes, um, Morris Metrolink, Kafka, you know, the intellectuals of the time. That was a discourse among the Iranian intellectuals, among the Iranian university students of 1979. This, this regime, however, has clamped down on any pretensions to the West or Western culture which they call Western cultural imperialism. In other words, it negates whatever the Shah has done. So if the Shah had, for example, in 1963 granted rights to women to vote, to be able to um, marry at the age of 18, not under the age of 18, which by the way, this regime changed it to age of nine and then changed it to 13. But if the father gives con consent, the daughter can still and should marry the, the, the person the father picks at the age of nine. Uh, <clears throat> so many of the laws in the constitution of um, 1979 are there, but they are not uh, upheld by this regime or the, by the henchmen of this regime, or they're completely ignored. Um, and the, the essence of this uprising is not about ideolo ideology that carried the 1979 revolution. It's not about the promise of utopia, about emancipation by a religious figure like Imam Khamenei, who was an Ayatollah who became an Imam um, by, the, by the revolutionaries. This is a societal change. This is a change by women, led by women, but also by young school children. And, and I don't know if you are, um, if you have any interest to look at the pictures that come out of the Iranian 
sites that Michael talked about, like Tasfir uh, 1500 and other websites, Iran International um, and their correspondents, they do a good job of collecting the facts on the ground and being able to um, create a cohesive narrative that Western audiences can follow. This is a, um, I'm, I'm elated to, to see the bravery and the courage of these women who have nothing but their fists and a few um, few stones to rocks to throw at the, at the police. Uh, but also I am saddened that this is a movement by the children of this country to serve their country. Um, and in an ironic twist, they have told their parents in so many words that you created this mess for us. Um, you brought up us, uh, you brought the, you enacted or you helped facilitate the arrival of uh, Khomeini and his henchmen. It's up to us to make change. So every woman in Iran considers herself a change maker. And that's not to discount the role of men who are supporting them. Uh, they are right there shoulder to shoulder with them. They are protesting, being killed, um, being detained. Um, there is a, a very profound uh, video of men uh, entering the Sharif University. Um, and they're standing at the entrance and they're creating a blockade so that women can go into the cafeteria that before was segregated. And they're cheering the women on and they're not allowing the police, which is behind them, pushing their way through. Which anyway, the barricade was broken through by the police and uh, God knows what happened to those men. But men also have been feeling the, the tragedy of the Islamic regime. It's not only the women who were repressed who are counted in the course of law as half as valued as a man. If you run over a man, um, you are compensated for it. But if you run over a woman, the same driver, same car, you're compensated only half as much. That's your judiciary for you. That's how they value half of their population. And we can talk all about the beautiful pictures of these women in headscarves that are Chanel or Gucci or whatever designer that, no, no, it's not so bad. You know, these are women with full makeup on and the headscarf is loose, but it's exactly the randomness of the so-called freedom that has pushed the Iranians over the edge. And it's the same randomness of uh, Mahsa Amini's death. Here is a, a woman, 22 years old, in a, from a Kurdish province um, that has, they, ha they have a very sheltered, nurturing lifestyle. It's very family oriented. She's never been to Tehran. She gets off the train on a platform. She's going to see her dentist. And she's pulled out by a basiji, a disgruntled basiji, which, you know, it's, it's at the whim of this person who looks at you and decides that, no, you're not properly hijabed or you're not properly dressed and pulls out and beaten on her head. And then there is this video of her walking around in the detention center and she collapses over the chair and then she collapses over the floor. So that video has been shown around by the Islamic regime as a proof that this poor girl had an underlying condition. And that's how, that's why she died. So as Michael so, um, so beautifully, he put it in the right words, you know, that the, the heart condition has become the major cause of these youth's deaths. Um, you know, it has become a parody in Iranian circles. You know, Iranians are never uh, shy of making a comical or a joke about something a tragic that's happened because they've lived with tragedy for such a long time. And they have said, uh, instead of when the regime says so-and-so person committed suicide, um, the parody by the Iranian protesters is that so-and-so person was committed suicide. In other words, he died in the hands of the police pretending that he died of, su of suicide. So it, it has become a situation where, and I, I think that's what speaks to what Michael said, that this is the longest uprising that Iran has ever experienced, how Iranian women and men and children, these 12-year-old kids that are in their high schools and tearing up the pictures of 
the supreme leader and, and the uh, Ayatollah Khomeini, the leader of the revolution, have moved beyond fear. And that's where the regime is getting nervous because it has relied on the concept of fear to rule. And um, it has indoctrinated, it has created this fearsome Islamic um, Iranian Republic uh, Guardians um, Corp, which is Islamic Republic Guardians Corp, which is IRGC, the acronym, which are indoctrinated into um, cracking down on protesters and being able to carry the Islamic revolution, being able to safeguard the narrative, being able to keep safe the Islamic values that the revolution is founded on. There are trained in something that's called DARVO, and I'm going to spell it out for you. It's D-A-R-V-O. It's deny, attack, reverse, victim, and oppressor. So they are told that when they are caught red-handed in a brutal act or a criminal act um, or a fatal blow to a protesters, they should act as if that the protesters were the actual oppressors and the police and the IRGC were the actual victims. So they reversed their roles and they denied that they had anything to do with it. So this is a fearsome cadre of officers or foot soldiers almost 300,000 strong that are trained in putting down protests and eliminating these protesters, which by the way, the foreign minister of Iran said today, um, ironically, that there are no protesters in Iran's prisons. These are rioters and terrorists. So if you have a grievance and if you air it in public space, you're not consistent as a protester or someone who dissents from the uh, prevalent um, political opinion, it's you're a rioter and a, uh, and a uh, terrorist, which by the way, sets the ground in the judiciary and, and uh, in the courts for you to be tried as um, involved in muharibe. Muharibe is an Arabic word, which comes from the root word haraba, which means fight or war. So these protesters are considered people who are fighting with God. So God has become the ultimate authority. Um, and God is the person or God is the entity that the Islamic judiciaries will present as being violated. There is no escaping from that kind of logic. If you are standing in a court of law or court of law in quotes, and your crime has to be fight against God, there is no um, there is no escape route, and many of these people that are detained in prison, most of them now are women. Um, Thirteen thousand people are, are detained and, in my op opinion, abducted because some of them are never heard of. Um, are there because they have been considered terrorist against God? Um, this is a dead ended situation for the Iranian society. But I just want to blow this up. Um, to think about, I, I don't know about the demography of this audience, but 1978-79 was a pivotal moment in the politics of the Middle East for two watershed events. One was the invasion of Afghanistan by the Soviets, and one was the fall of the Shah. And whatever our foreign policy blunders were then, Middle East has not been the same ever. We have seen the rise of political Islam, the rise of Taliban, the ISIS uh, takeover groups of uh, uh, Middle East and North Africa. We have seen the sectarian difference between the Sunnis and Shiites coming to sharp focus in Iraq and Yemen. So these women protests are not about women in Iran anymore. And I think that's what the women want the world to know. And that's how they want to articulate their anger and their desire, their anger at this regime and their desire for regime change so that the world will know that this moment may not be ever repeated again, but this is an opportunity for the international community to push the reset button and change the region. So again, it's, it's a... It's a grassroots female 
led revolution, the first of its kind in history that needs our support because we all have mothers, sisters, daughters. We understand the grievance. We, we connect with it. We stand for justice. We advocate for our uh, end of oppression. But also we want to see this regime um, take off its chokehold on its own people and on the region. It's, it's, it's a win-win situation if this regime um, collapses. And I cannot think of a more profound moment in the past 43 years, which by the way, has been a test case for Iran where they tried um, the Islamic regime's tenets and doctrines and they said, this is not for us, this is not our culture. And they said, this is it. Uh, we cannot be a participant to this anymore. We cannot be randomly picked. We cannot be detained. We cannot be abducted. We cannot be killed summarily in kangaroo courts. We deserve better. And the world deserves better. But that's, that's the connection. Iranians deserve better. But I think the world deserves better than what the Islamic regime has done to it. It's not even about the Middle East. What happens in the Middle East does not stay in the Middle East. I'm now in Europe and I have passed by so many um, markers on the sidewalk and in restaurants where an attack has happened by militant groups, by militant Islamic groups. And there are um, there's still flowers on the sidewalk uh, commemorating the, the assassination of such and such person or Charlie Hebdo and the journalists. So, so my plea to policymakers that I have met in Washington and also outside of Washington, D.C., and they shall remain, they shall remain unnamed, um, my plea for them is that uh, trade their apathy for empathy and consider what um, the region could be without a... Um, I, I don't have the right word to describe the Islamic regime. Without a bad actor, honestly, it's, it's, it's a regime that thrives of enmity with the West. It's one of the tenets of the Islamic government, which is the compilation of Khomeini's writings over 10 years that was put together in 1970, between 1970 and 1979, and was added to it. Enmity with the West, um, creating a dialogue or a narrative where the West is bound to subjugate uh, Muslims and the Iranians, um, creating this image that uh, there's always a ulterior motive be behind whatever the citizens of Iran ask for because they're the pawns in the hands of Western imperialism. These are the kind of discourses that are not accepted as norms anymore. And they're not accepted by this new generation and more importantly, they're not accepted by Iranian women who have seen through it. They've lived it. They have been barred from entering stadiums. They have been barred from becoming judges. They have been barred uh, by uh, for asking for a fair uh, trial or in a, uh, a a good outcome in a divorce settlement. These are the people that have lived this nightmare know about this nightmare. It's not that it's the end of the test case and they want this regime gone. I don't have a hopeful note on that, but I, I do have this note that I, I, want, I want the audience to consider an Iran that's a secular democratic Iran in that region of the world where it hopefully becomes a beacon of democracy pluralism for the rest of the countries in the region. And then once we have that new norm in mind, we can work through it and we can work forward. We can work forward. And I hope to be able to translate that to actual policies by Western policymakers. <laughs>
Thanks very much, Nizi, for sharing your perspective. Again, as we finish panelist remarks, we welcome your questions. So please submit them at the bottom of the screen in the Q&A box or email them to cna underscore nss at cna.org. And now I'll invite Mike to join me again as we take some questions from the audience. So uh, Mike, in the uh, Q&A box, there, there's a question to you. Uh, they talk about labor unions uh, and their, their participation in these protests, and they talk about climate-related factors, uh, particularly water security. Uh, but, but taking a step back, and I want to bring Nazi into this as well, uh, who, who are the main stakeholders that we should be thinking about? Uh, of course, we're, we're talking about women today uh, and, and their critical role, uh, but also uh, as the questioner asked about labor unions, uh, Nazi, you, you pointed out uh, the TikTok generation and the role of children as well. Uh, so uh, Mike, why, why don't you kick us off and, and talk about some of the stakeholders that, that we should be thinking about? Well, I think the, the labor union point is an excellent one. Um, labor unions have been very active in the protests. You had the labor strikes, the um, oil refineries where the workers engage in strikes. You have teacher union now also engaging in strikes. And the labor unions are critical because they're one of the few elements in the protests that are very organized and centralized. So when these strikes take place, um, it's, it displays an organization that just simply isn't there in some other elements of the protests. The protests are popular, but they're sort of amorphous. There are people being brought out on the street by reading things online, by being upset, by, by being motivated by their colleagues. But, but the labor unions are an organized element. So that's why I think they're, they're particularly potent um, opposition uh, force in these protests. About the environmental factor you raised, um, you know, I mean, uh, water water shortages have certainly been an issue for Iran in rural areas, particularly in the in southern Iran and places uh, in the south, the southeast. I don't think it's a major driving factor in these protests. I mean, it's it is a factor. I just don't see it as one of the top, you know, three or four or five. But I think the labor the labor union issue should be looked at in, in more detail because that's a critical factor. Nazi, what are your thoughts on? stakeholders, uh, the, the array of stakeholders we should be thinking about and, and contributing factors as well? Uh, that, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Uh, I, again, I can't help my uh, making parallels between what hap what's happening now on the ground in Iran and what happened in 1979. So 1979, um, we have, well, from 1977 to 1979, we have this slow burnout movement where there is a pocket of unrest here and intellectuals go on strike and they write letters and, and people want a little bit more uh, participation in political space. But as time goes by, um, it, it reaches a critical point where, where the revolution kind of unleashes its forces. And, and, and the spark that set the spirit on fire was the fire of, of a cinema in Southern Iran called Rex which was done by the, by the own regime um, people and 500 people died in the fire. So that, that kind of uh, set, set the movement in motion. So the people who are creating that movement again are workers and bazaaris and, and students and, and um, shopkeepers, even lawyers and um, doctoral medicines in University of Shiraz today. Uh, the petrochemical industry in Iran is not under sanctions. The, the oil sanction and petrochemical industries are two different things. So Iran has diverted a lot of its resources to expanding the petrochemical industry. And those workers went on strike two weeks ago. And that's a huge source of income for, for this regime. Uh, additionally, the fact that the, 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 there are pockets of unrest everywhere in Iran, as Michael said when he started, talks about the inability of this regime to focus, to target one section of the population and 
cracked down heavily. So when they cracked down in university in Tehran, like the Sharif University, the universities in Shiraz and Isfahan erupt. When they cracked down in uh, in Kurdistan or Balochistan, which they tried, they tried to set an example by cracking down heavily and killing 80 people, as you heard Michael say, um, basically randomly. Then other areas of, of Iran, um, Babel and Amul in northern Iran erupt. So as you said, it's like a whack-a-mole. And, and, and I think that kind of has put the regime on its heels and, and, and it's, it's trying to play catch up right now. But I agree that it's not, they haven't unleashed the, the measure of brutality that one expects the regime to, to do. But almost everybody who's asking for this regime change is now a stakeholder. Um, this regime has permeated every aspect of everyone's lives, from what you wear, what you say, what you read, how you pray, who you go out with, what you eat, where you travel to, um, what publications are allowed and whatnot. So in, in other words, um, this is ubiquitous now. This is um, no longer about where is my vote of 2009. It's no longer about um, climate change and its, its consequences and the cattle dying and the farms drying up as we had in 2017 and 2019. It's a societal change. It's a societal demand for change. And I think everyone, again, as I said, has a stake in this. And everyone is a change maker. By the way, one of the hashtags or slogans of this regime is has been, um, I'm a leader you're the leader, we're all the leader, let's go. So um, true, we need, a, we need a revolutionary leader. You cannot have a revolution without revolutionaries. We have them on the ground. We don't have anyone they have coalesced around. Um, but I don't think that matters at this point. I think uh, Iranian society has come to a point where they understand they have agency and they're just thinking of toppling this regime. And they might even be that we will never see a figure claiming the mantle of this revolution. It might be that this regime might collapse under the weight of its own um, uh, contradictions and brutality, and somebody will emerge, or it might somebody will never emerge, and maybe somebody will be voted in by the Iranian population. But I don't know how this genie is going to be put back in a bottle, and, and that's a good thing. There's a related question in the chat uh, about powerful stakeholders or any domestic institutions that are in alliance with the protesters, either overtly or covertly. Uh, so Nazi, uh, why don't you respond and then uh, we'll go to Mike. So um, overtly or covertly coming out as being against the regime is, is um, very rapidly evolving. But resistance has been the name of, in other words, resistance has been their ammunition. I know the lawyers were on strike. They, um, they, they gathered in front of the judiciary, I think in Tehran, and they demanded uh, change and reform and they demanded uh, certain judiciary uh, practices that needed to be banned or reformed. And I know that doctors went on strike in one city and, and there were pockets of this. But I don't know, Michael, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't know of any overt um, domestic organization other than the strikes that we just talked about that has come out in support of the protesters. Michael? Yeah, I, no, I agree. I mean, I think there have been some clerics who were affiliated with the regime who have said they've kind of minced their language and they said, well, we have to, we should listen to some aspects of what the protesters are saying or you know, sort of like moderating their language and things. But no, I agree. I don't, I don't see any sort of over uh, support for the protests from anybody on the inside of the regime. But, but in that regard, I think it will be really interesting to watch what happens with, with um, the security services. Cause I mean, that's, if you start seeing defections there, and I think it's possible you could see some defections, particularly on the, on the police side. You know, that's something that the regime's gonna be very concerned about if that happens. That I can make, if I can add something to that. Um, at the Council on Foreign Relations, I worked for Ray Tukay, who's the brilliant um, 
political analyst on Iran, and he just came out with an article that says exactly that, Michael, that he thinks the savior of this regime is that if the police put down their arms. And this is also a replay of 1979, where I remember people, including my own aunts and uncles, walking down the boulevard and adding a carnation into the barrel of, a barrel of the um, police's guns or um, the army's guns, and they, they put down their arms. But again, you know, if we're talking about vestiges and IRGC henchmen who have been indoctrinated, kind of a mind control, actually, and, and, and I, I hate to use the word brainwashed, but it's such a cliche, but they have been exactly trained for this, for this moment where the pillars of the regime are crumbling and it's up to the IRGC at no matter what cost to secure these pillars and crack down on protesters. And Michael, if you remember, uh, there is a audio tape uh, from 2019 from Khamenei's National Security Council where he's sitting and he's telling the people around him um, officially to kill, kill as many people as you can. Don't hold back. Don't hold back. You have to kill as many people as you can. So when you're when you're confronted with that with that kind of brutality, what do you do? And that's a that's a that's a question I have no answer for. I, I know where my heart lies, but I cannot tell you that I want my country men and women to go out and get killed. And I'm sitting here in a Western country, comfortable in my own environment, and being able to say what I want to say and do what I want to do. And I'm cheering for these people to be out on the streets and killed. It, yeah, it's no, a I totally, I totally agree with you on that. I mean, I think the the Bas siege are a tough nut to crack. Um, unlike most of the other security services, even even the IRGC to a certain extent relies on conscripts. But the Bas siege is an all volunteer force. They're ideologically vetted. Um, so it's I, I don't see them really cracking under the protests, but. You know, if the police start to defect and other regime elements start to defect and and they're left leaderless, you know, who knows what could happen. But it's one thing's for certain. It's going to get bloodier before it gets better, I think, unfortunately. I just don't see the regime sort of saying, oh, you know, yes, it's, you know, this has gone on long enough. We really need to reform or we really need to, to back off. We're seeing the Supreme Leader saying, I'm going to resign. I mean, it's not going to happen, but... So we've talked about a, a variety of stakeholders that, that we should be tracking during this crisis. Uh, one uh, question in the Q&A is uh, talking about the, the IRGC. The, they say the difference between 79 and now, as you rightly say, is the IRGC. The only real opposition they face is the military. So, uh, Mike, what, what are your thoughts? What do you think the, where do you think the military is, is likely to stand? Oh, if you're talking about the regular, the Artesh, uh, the conventional forces, um, they're they're fairly apolitical. Um, you know, the in the past there were instances where the regime questioned the loyalty of the Artesh, but I don't. You know, the regime's done a pretty good job in terms of the leadership, anyway, of rooting out any opposition. I mean, anybody who progresses in the armed forces is vetted for their loyalty to the regime. So I don't think you're gonna see it at the leadership level, there's not gonna be a big difference between the, you're not gonna see a lot of daylight between the IRGC and the Artesh. At the rank and file level, perhaps, but traditionally the Artesh has really stayed out of politics and hasn't gotten involved. Um, again, I bring it back to the police because I think they're a critical factor. The police are actually by numbers larger than the Artesh and the active duty IRGC. So, so by sheer numbers, they're a pretty large force and, and they're composed of conscripts and the morale in the police is not necessarily good. In the past, we've done some, um, we've done some research on, on, on the armed forces and recruitment in Iran and, and morale is certainly a factor in the police. When you get, um, part of it has to do with just where they're assigned and what they have to do. But it's it's you know there there is a possibility of of um, some daylight appearing there. Nazi, what are your thoughts on the military? Well, I, I agree with Michael. The Artish, which is the regular military of Iran, um, it, it's a it's a kind of a um, uh, interesting hybrid of um, 
where the regime wants its military to be and where the Iranians see their military, Iranian protesters see their military functioning as. So Artish is um, to, to maintain the law and order um, between the Iranian provinces and not so much about defending the borders, defending the borders and projecting the power outside of Iran has been relegated to the IRGC. And Artish has historically been apolitical, as Michael said. But interestingly enough, they voted overwhelmingly for President Khatami, who was their reformist president um, and ran on the agenda of opening the dialogue of civilization. And he had that famous um, speech where also at the United Nation, he invited to sit down with other Western countries. He supposedly has a PhD from a German university in philosophy. He was considered to be the, um, the, 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 the person or the leader who would bridge the West to Iran. And as a result would open up foreign direct investment and ameliorate the economy. So the Artesh overwhelmingly uh, voted for him. Um, and I don't know how much they have changed since then. I think, again, as Michael said, the rank and file, I, I still, I think they understand the pain of their um, co-Iranians that are out on the street and being killed. They may even have a sister that's out there and protesting. And they may even have a mom who's been detained by the IRGC and the BCG and the police. But um, the upper echelons, um, they're all indoctrinated in safekeeping Islamic theocracy, um, the Islamic government's values and system. And, and, I, and, and that's a tough, tough nut to crack. Okay, I want to uh, take this more into thinking about effects of the, the current uh, crisis. Uh, let's start within Iran. Do, do you think these protests are signaling a, a fundamental shift in terms of gender norms within Iran? Uh, Nazi, over to you first. Um, I want to be bold and say I think that shift has already happened. And I, we, we can see it on the streets, but I think um, just within the past 20 years, as internet has opened up to Iranian households and, and portable cell phones and satellite dishes, I think there has been a, um, a readjusting of gender norms within the Iranian society, maybe away from the eyes of the mullahs and the ayatollahs. What we see out on this street is a manifestation of years of this happening inside, in, within, within the Iranian society and away from the Western eyes. And now we see it on television. So I, I, whatever happens after today and whether there's a revolution and we might have a secular democratic Iran, where that gender norm settles itself um, might not be very um, unlike what's happening in the Western societies where you have a healthy, dynamic female labor participation um, in the workforce, and they may have a gender gap uh, in pay. Um, actually, right now, according to World Economic Forum, Iran is 143 out of 145 countries in gender gap. That's two away from the worst. <laughs> um, and and this is not the norm. Iranian women were free to do what they wanted before the revolution. They were given all the opportunities that men were, uh, were given at the time of the Shah. This is not an advocacy for the reign, uh, regime of the Shah. This is just to let you know and your audience to know that this was not the norm. This is not the Iran that people knew. Um, Iran has a healthy, educated, dynamic, curious, younger population who are the children of the parents who were also educated and dynamic and were educated in the West at the point before the Islamic revolution, there were 55,000 Iranian students in US funded and um, paid for by the Shah so that they can come back um, as a workforce and serve in Iran. Many of them were Iranian women and many of the Iranian women that came back had ministry jobs and there were judges and they were 
representative at the United Nations. And actually, the Shah's sister was one representative to the United Nations on Women's Council. Under this regime, Iran is represented again on the UN Status and Commission of Women, but it's it's cracking down on its half of its population and it's 143 out of 145 countries in gender gap. So there is a there is a disconnect somewhere in there, but um but I I will leave it up to Michael to say um what he thinks of this idea of, of this question. But um I think I said enough. Yeah, no, I, I don't have much to add to it. And as he said, I think she's exactly right. I do think that the transformation in gender issues has already occurred largely in Iran. It's being tamped down by the government and by regulations. But I mean, Iranian women, you know, go to universities, they're very educated. They, 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 they look at, you know, they have access to the outside world through internet. They see, they, you know, they see what Iran could be um, versus what it is. <laughs> it is exactly right. So one of our questions asks about effects on the global stage. So before we get there, uh, let's think outside Iran. W what do you see as the, the regional effects uh, of these protests? Uh, Mike, why don't you start? You know, I mean, the, the region has already been under a lot of convulsion. It's not a very stable region in general, but we had the Arab Spring, you saw the protests that occurred in starting in um, North Africa and then spreading to the rest of the region. Some even say, actually, they started in Iran in 2009 and then spread to the Arab world and then spread back again. Um, so the, the region is fairly unstable as it is. I don't see the unrest in Iran directly contributing to any unrest in neighboring countries. But over the long term, if Iran were to undergo some sort of transformation, whatever that transformation is, it could inspire um, inspire people in the region and beyond living in you know authoritarian regimes to also take matters into their own hands. But that's long term; it's not near term. Um, you know, if if the unrest spreads in Iran, I think the only the only way that would infect neighboring regions would be through allies and partners of the Iranian government right now. So we're talking about the axis of resistance. So if you're talking about, you know, Hezbollah's position in Lebanon, or you're talking about um, parties, political parties in Iraq that are aligned with Iran, if the Iranian government's uh, reputation is tarnished, um, then by by association, their own reputations become somewhat tarnished as well. Um, so near term, that's the issue. Long term, though, it's tough to say. It's, you know, a lot of things could happen. And what about thoughts on the global stage? Is that for me? Uh, no, uh, Mike first. Mike, you're on mute. Sorry. Uh, globally, um, it's, it's really speculative. I, I don't know what to say about that other than, you know, the, again, the revolution, if, if something were to happen in Iran, as Nazi says, she's calling a revolution. If, if the revolution were to succeed, um, that would obviously serve as an inspiration to, you know, to people living under authoritarian regimes worldwide. But, you know, the immediate effects would be, you know, Iran's government, which has had somewhat of a destabilizing influence on the region would be would be taken out of the mix, perhaps, depending on where things are going. So you would see, you know, Iran, the go current government has its hands in, in stuff that's happening in Yemen, in Iraq, in um, Lebanon, in Syria. So, you know, Iran punches above its weight in the region. And if the government were to, to suffer a serious upset at home, um, some of that stuff could change regionally. Globally, I'm not quite so sure, though. Nazi, what, what are your thoughts on, on the effects of the protests at the regional level as well as at the global level? Um, you know, I, I, I always have thought, um, I, it's been one of the things I've been saying um, forever, that I thought the next revolution would be on the back of Iranian women. And, 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 and um, 
happy to stand on that record. Uh, I, I don't feel vindicated because we still have a regime that's cracking down heavily on, on people and we, we need to change that. But on, on a regional level, uh, it's always good to shed light on women's plight. Um, it's always good to remind the rest of the world that the world will be better off if, if it's half of its population is, is considered um, equal or worthy of respect and full rights. But it's also what this, what this protest have done have created this image that women have agency and, and you cannot take that message away from what you see on your TV screens or on your telephone screens. And I, I think just the fact that women have been, especially in MENA in Middle East and North Africa, have been portrayed as victims for so long by the repressive regimes. And now they're victors in a way. Now they have understood that they can create change. Another crack in the glass ceiling, as, as Secretary Clinton said. Um, but this one, this one is a very thick glass ceiling and really supported by a brutality of so many, so many dictators around. Uh, but it's always good to get inspired by the movement in Iran. If I'm sitting in Saudi Arabia, Iraq, um, Yemen, Kuwait, I mean, and I don't know where else can I say, almost everywhere, Pakistan, Afghanistan, am I nervous? Do I think that, um, that my women are going to rise up and demand justice? I, I think I would be, and I, I think that's a good place for them to be. I think if that allows them to preemptively and slowly and at their own pace, open up the political space, open up the society to allow women to participate and be fully considered as a full citizen of their country, I think that's a good thing. If, if I am betting again against it, that protests in Iran will not create a seismic change in the Middle East, I think I'm standing on the wrong side of history. I'm a little bit more optimistic than Michael. I think this is not the Arab Spring. I don't want to call it the Iran Spring. I don't think Iran needed a rebirth or re rejuvenation of its aspirations. I don't think they were ever asleep. I think um, this has been always the undercurrent of um, unhappiness in the, within the Iranian society since day one. I don't think they, they knew what they were bargaining for when they got rid of the Shah. Um, so right now, I, I think the region's leaders should feel a little, hopefully a little threatened by this. And I hope that they will keep that in consideration when they are enforcing laws that are not inclusive of their women, um, that are not uh, inclusive of, of their rights of the youth, the, and I hope they will not crack down on internet access. I think that will be the death knell of the region's dictators um, that are banking on the force of the brutality of their security apparatus, apparatus to hold on to their power. And I think that's a shaky ground to be on at any point. And I think these protests have started shaking that even a little bit harder. Now, as we close, let's think about what can be done. So Anazi, starting with you, well, one of our oh, audience members has... Yes. Well, one of our audience members has a question essentially about what role the West can play in supporting this movement in Iran, uh, asks about the, the U.S. in particular, but, but thinking uh, broadly in terms of the global stage, the, the women, peace and security agenda that originated out of a U.N. Uh, resolution. Uh, what are your thoughts in, in terms of the globally what can be done or, or key actors? Uh, Nezi first. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you for asking that question. Anybody or everybody or the few that asked that question because there a lot could be done. Uh, we are far from Iran, but we're not that far. The world has become a much smaller space place. Uh, I would not sit with Iranian representatives, diplomats, they're none of them are diplomats. 
at any international forum, at any table where I'm negotiating with them. I would not trust a negotiating partner that lies to its own people and kills them when they're uncovered, the lies are uncovered. I would not trust that. I would not trust a signature under any deal, JCPOA or otherwise, as a signature that we hold them accountable. This regime will do whatever it can to stay in power, which by the way, one of them is acquiring nuclear technology so that they can have a bomb at the end of when the, when the clause is sunset and they can race through acquiring enough nuclear material to create a bomb. This regime will do whatever it can to stay on power. I would not sit at the negotiating table with them. I would kick out all the diplomats from Western countries or the coalition countries that are like-minded like us. I would uh, enact uh, Magnitsky sanctions, which are broad, sex, broad sanctions the way we did against Russia, to make sure that these sanctions have teeth and are implantable. We don't want sanctions that cannot work. We want sanctions that are on the books and then they jump off the books and are actually in effect. So I would do that. I would talk to Meta and ask them to create hash flags. You know, right now we have Masa Amini's hashtag that has been repeated over 150 million times, but we have all these other Masa Amini fake hashtags that the regime has created or regime lobbies have created to dilute the message. I would get rid of that. I would ask Meta to create hash flags that speak directly to these protests. I would do more VPNs to allow the Iranian people and I would share them to as, with as many people as possible. I would talk to Instagram to say, excuse me, Instagram, why are you cracking down on all these people who are sharing actual footage of the protests on Iran, but they're banned. Their, their accounts are suspended on Instagram. I get daily 60 to 70 texts a day, basically asking me to help them find a way that they can come back online. Um, and I, I would keep the pressure up. I would keep the pressure up. This is how change happens. Go back to 43 years ago when this was not the case. And we are created another opportunity. We're given another opportunity to make change happen so that it will benefit the community of nations. Keep the pressure up. Be the voice of Iranian women. Act and advocate for them. Speak of justice. Follow their, follow their hashtags. Be visible on social media. Try to write to your representatives asking them to keep the pressure up. Pick up the phone and talk to them. In other words, make noise and don't give up. Thanks, Nadi. Uh, Mike, over to you. Uh, thinking about what can be done, uh, what about the role of the West, the, the United States, if at all, and, and even globally? You know, I think that the critical thing, and Nazi kind of hit on this already, but the, the critical thing is information. Um, the regime views the free flow of information as a threat. Um, and, you know, perhaps they're right, actually. You know, the, the, the fact that people can be motivated by what they see when these, when, you know, the regime cracks down on people and, and photos of, of them or, or um, films of them, you know, beating up protesters or leaked to the outside world and, to, and other Iranians can see what's happening. That is a threat to the regime. Um, so if you're looking for something that the West can do, I think more than anything else, it's really assisting in the information space. It's ensuring that, as Nazi said, the, you know, the legitimate um, you know, Instagram accounts that, that show what's going on don't get closed down. Um, ensuring that, that the regime's attempts to cut off the information flow can be bypassed by people in Iran. The free flow of information is basically the, the foundation of democracy. If you don't have the free flow of information, democracy can't flourish. And regimes that can't handle the free flow of information, um, you know, are, are on a, on a, a downward uh, glide slope. So, you know, we should be doing everything we can to, to be giving Iranians the tools they need to access information. So that could involve, for instance, SATCOM capabilities. You know, the Elon Musk, you know, has been a lot about what he's been doing in Ukraine, but he's also, there's been some, you know, attempts to, to distribute Starlink terminals to, um, to Iranian protesters. From what I understand, they haven't worked very well. Part of that's probably because the regime's trying to jam the satellite communications. But but, you know, Starlink is a is kind of an example of, you know, the West should be doing more of that. So that's that's I'd focus on the information aspect. 
Thanks, Mike. That, that speaks to uh, another stakeholder group, really, the, the role of social media companies and, and media, news media companies. Uh, okay, uh, we just have a couple minutes left. So I'd like to go to Nazi and then uh, Mike for any final comments. Um, I, I, I think I started with my final comments, actually. So I, I, I said what I needed to say. Don't give up your advocacy. Um, justice denied anywhere is justice denied everywhere, to paraphrase our hero, Martin Luther King. Um, it's important that this revolution succeeds. It's important that Iranians become part of the community of nations, uh, Iran as a country. It's if you want to have an ally in the region, Iran is a perfect, perfect candidate to be that ally that could hopefully set up, set off um, change in the region. Uh, their population is Western oriented. A lot of them speak English. Um, they're educated. Women are a big part of Iranian uh, fabric of society, as you can see by these protests. Uh, they don't think American Israel and England are their enemy. They laugh at their leaders for saying that. So whatever needs to be done to make sure that we can reverse the regression, the, the falling back in time that the regime brought this country back to 13th century with outdated ideology and, and Islamic doctrines, please let's make sure this is an opportunity and that's how I want to finish it. Women are doing everything they can. Please support them. Thank you. Thanks, Nazi. Mike, any final comments? No, I think uh, Nazi said it very well. She's a tough act to follow. Uh, but basically, I would just say, look at, the, look at what's happening in Iran and keep an eye out for some of those indicators and warnings that I mentioned. So coalescing, coalescing of objectives by the protesters, the emergence of, of sort of an opposition leadership, um, which I think would help, may not be 100% necessary, but I think it certainly would help. And also defections, critically defections from the regime's base of support. Um, that's, those are, I think, the factors we should be looking at if we're assessing progress. But other than that, I have nothing to add. Great. Well, uh, thank you both for this timely discussion. I'll pass it back to Holly for some concluding remarks. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, thanks to our panelists for sharing their expertise and insights uh, for today's discussion. I think that was a great note to, to end. Um, let's use the power we have here to empower the people uh, in Iran to bring more peace. Um, we can always use advocacy um, to influence the policies in the West. So with that, um, I'd also like to um, thank you all for joining us today. Um, for those of you who know CNA, welcome back. And for the new guests, we hope this is the first of many times that we will have the opportunity to engage with you and we can keep the dialogue started here going. Thank you and have a great year.